victorious up on the screen and as we sung how great thou art and victory in Jesus, all those. We might even pop into another one today as we look at our message that's going to tie together to Romans 8 again, but in a different passage, in a different area. For introduction, why don't you join me in 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, we'll get there in a moment uh, again to set up our short series, our mini preaching series, uh, Victorious. Um, and uh, of course, this past week, we, we uh, celebrated the life of someone who has victory and is now uh, left us behind. And uh, in Jesus, Don Pratt, uh, when she, of course, passed away two Sundays ago, we actually even started this series then. And, and uh, it's kind of just neat in God's timing, of course, how he put this together uh, a couple months, two or three months ago, and, and looking at, again, a short series uh, preaching through the word and, and the topic of being victorious in Jesus just before our Acts 1A conference. And, and that is uh, not far away. I know that we keep banners up on the, up on the walls throughout the year for our theme from, from the year before, and you will see those coming down and new ones going up. In reference to our Acts 1A conference this coming year, uh, a holy calling. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verses 8 through 12. The highlighted verse is uh, verse number 9. And that will be starting up two Sundays from now. Next week we'll have our last message in our victorious series. And then we'll be looking to get into the Word of God and, and celebrate um, a time in our our church schedule, our season of uh, really what we look at as the championship of our, our ministry, our Acts 1-8 mission and vision of the church, the Acts 1-8 uh, church mission uh, that we are witnesses and that we have the power in the Holy Ghost to go Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts. Well, we celebrate that once a year in a big way, even though we do it frequently throughout the year, and this is a big time, our Acts 1-8 conference, set aside some time for the conference next Sunday, you will have your brochure to be able to keep up with everything. Pick up your brochure next Sunday. They'll be here in the auditorium. They'll be with our ushers and our, our welcome team and our, our info hub squad that's out there in the lobby. And then, of course, they'll be out there in the fellowship hall. They'll be in the cafe. They'll be out in the coffee house. Grab a brochure and make sure that you know what's going on next Sunday. Start planning already. I mean, it's already on the calendar. If you had a yearly calendar back in January, you knew that we would be having our Acts 1-8 conference. It's an Acts 1-8 missions conference that we look forward to every single year. Again, we have, um, again, on the, on the schedule, everything that's going to be going on. We'll have uh, some missionaries here, and then I'll come right back to that schedule just to remind you what's on the schedule. But we have Steve Kern coming to preach to us. I've mentioned that he was going to be our guest speaker, Good News in Action, that ministry. We have been together with him for a number of years. He's been a missionary in Central America for 30-ish years. He has been here, I think the last time was five or six years ago. He was here with Julio Contreras, but we've been involved in the ministry work of Good News in Action and Vida Nueva in the 020 Metro America window and that vision there. Nelson Rivas will be here. He is a missionary church planner in Guatemala. Uh, David Guadron, missionary church planter in Bogota, Colombia. They are friends of our church. They have, uh, we have visited them uh, on more than one occasion, different groups and different uh, mission uh, team uh, um, trips over the years. Uh, gosh, you went on the first one, didn't you, Roger? Is that five years ago, maybe, or six? Yeah. Wow. And you haven't aged a day. <laughs> Amen. I know. It's a couple years later. I think 18 or 19 maybe. So 18 or 19. So uh, it'll be good to have them come in. We haven't seen them in a number of years. And then Jose Valter, he is the missionary church plant in Honduras. Our team went to visit him. We had a team of six people. And they went to do some street work, saw some people get saved. Uh, Mike Pratt even referenced that in our um, and our memorial service for Don on Friday and his message. So uh, we're going to have a, a very special night, two Wednesdays from now. This coming Wednesday is our youth ministry summer camp celebration. And then the following Wednesday, the 29th, we will be having a Honduras mission team uh, night, uh, testimonies, all kinds of things going on. And 
Hosea's arranged his calendar to be here for that. And so he's going to be here that night on the 29th. Make sure I'll make sure there's an email out next week to remind you of things. And I know all of you read your emails uh, diligently and regularly. So make sure that you, again, set some time aside. Join us for as many services as you can. Nelson Rivas and David Guadrón will be preaching in the fellowship hall. Steve Kern will be preaching in here, both services. We do that every year. The 9 o'clock slot will be Nelson. The 1030 slot will be David. And they will both be preaching the word of God on that Sunday, October 3rd. And then we will have each one of our missionaries Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. in the coffee house for uh, coffee and dessert, and they'll be sharing the work a little bit. But on those, that Sunday, they'll be preaching on uh, 9 o'clock slot and on the 1030 slot. All those that are involved in those two slot time slots or anybody that wants to go to hear those two preach, they can, of course, and Steve will be preaching in here on Sunday morning. So make sure that you get thinking about it, get your brochure next week, already be putting away the time so that you can be here as many times as you can. One more thing, fill out your commitment card. The commitment cards will be around next Sunday. They are, of course, for you to make a commitment. All of you that have done that, done so in the past, you're familiar with it. Those that are new to the idea of committing to giving to missions above your tithe, above your normal giving and the way you do your tithe every week. But I love to give the missions $50 a month, $10 a month, whatever it may be. That's an opportunity for you to commit to that on our Acts 1-8 conference commitment card. There's one other thing up there, as you can see on the screen, the 25th anniversary project that we have, been, we have mentioned the first part of May. Now you will hear quite a bit more about it. But here you are coming to the place where I said that we would take up an offering and make sure that we took an offering toward our 25th anniversary and the project I presented to a lot of you. Uh, many of you have heard about it. Very simply, we are going to do something for our 25th anniversary to dress up our auditorium, do something with our carpet, and some painting on the walls and things like that. And so we are going to take up the offering on that Sunday and during the, the conference time and through the month of October, we'll take up that special offering. You can also just make a commitment and say, hey, I'm going to commit to that and I will give that money by the end of the year. That would be wonderful and that would be just fine. We will be entering that project 2022 at the beginning when the bell rings on January 1. Just think our 25th anniversary is less than eight months away. And that, uh, that time perspective is really crazy. Our charity golf tournament is not far away. We're in the midst of uh, some of our fall things that we're doing. Um, the investors have a big sing tonight. Woohoo! There's lots going on. Our Bible Institute's getting started. Lots of stuff. So good things. Things in the family. Things in missions. Things in sports. Pee Wee football. We had our second Saturday yesterday. And the kids generally were tired I think. I don't know. I think they were a little, well, coaching five and six-year-olds is, uh, is so enjoyable. Yes, 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 yes. We really enjoy it. I, I had about 11 assistant coaches yesterday for 10 kids, and uh, whew, we still had a tough time. <laughs> but really, it's, uh, it's been wonderful to minister to those young boys and girls in our Pee Wee Football League, another way to touch their lives with the gospel. And I can tell you that the nine kids, I have ten kids on my team, nine of them there yesterday, they are uh, like deer in the headlights when it comes to telling them about different things in the Bible. Of the nine children yesterday, two of them knew about Noah. Opportunity, opportunity. That was our break time yesterday. Noah did all that God commanded him to do. Now, all the five and six-year-olds knew about being disobedient. That was no problem. <laughs> they just didn't know about Noah being so obedient. And, of course, that was, it's just an incredible opportunity. Again, we're in the midst of missions, family, and sports and the things that God has for us. We're going to get into the Word of God. I've got about an hour and a half message. We should be out here just in time for the Chiefs tonight. What time they play? Six o'clock. We should be there just in time. We'll walk through our text and our introduction first. And then we're going to go into Romans chapter number 8 and look at verses 18 through 25. Last week we looked at 
a passage of scripture a little bit further on in Romans 8 that talked about being more than conquerors. The week before we looked at a passage of scripture that spoke of what Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail, prevail against his church, the ecclesia. That that is a on the offensive, victorious in Jesus Christ message. Last week, looking at more than conquerors. It's really a going on the offense. So today, as we look at 1 Corinthians 15 and look at the introduction and learn a little bit about what Jesus Christ is saying to the church through Paul the Apostle, as Paul finished up his letter to the church at Corinth, he's saying, again, Look at what you have as a victory in Jesus Christ. We pick it up in verse number 50. God led me to use this passage plus also too earlier on in chapter number 15 using verses 16 through 22 at the graveside ceremony for Don this past week. You see, this is to me as you think about a woman, a brother, or a sister in the Lord who really lives out the word in their victory in Jesus. To me, Dawn was just the essence of 1 Corinthians 15, 58. She was unmovable, steadfast. None of the things that she did was in vain as far as I watched. I'm sure she would attest differently because she knew herself, but this is where we're at, victorious in Jesus Christ. Verse 50, let's read our text as an introduction, and then we'll go to Romans chapter number 8. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. Here's that verse, the theme verse is such a strong few words, but such a great meaning to our faith believers. Thanks be to God which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The the Lord God has given us a victory through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, when you stop and say right there, that's good, that's a great letter. That's a great message. You go into chapter number 16, that's pretty uh, high rejoicing time, praising all the brothers and sisters, the church. Paul mentions all kinds of good things, but before he gets into that last few verses... Verse number 58, and I mentioned it earlier, it ought to be a theme song of the believers. People should look at us as believers and followers in Jesus and say, you know, that person's unmovable. They're steadfast. They seem to never never stop. Well, that's what Paul's telling the church at Corinth. He's telling us through the Holy Spirit Therefore, my beloved brethren, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, right here, come on, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Again, when you relate to all that the wisest man in the Old Testament said about vanity, life is vanity, vanity, uh, vanity of vanities, vexation of spirit, it's just for nothing. That's the way the wisest man Solomon ended his life in his writings in Ecclesiastes. So many proverbs. And you think, was your life really for nothing? Can your life be for nothing? In Jesus, we're told, believers, beloved, brethren, that this should not be for nothing. Your life is not purposeless, but yet we flounder a little bit because we don't really, really sometimes, and sometimes it's just the course of a few days, or maybe it's a few weeks get by, or maybe, unfortunately, it's months we go, oh, I feel like I'm always defeated. But this verse is up here because we used it the very first time, and I think it bears repeating. 
It has something to do with what it says in verse number 52, 53, 54, 55. Through his victory over the grave, Jesus Christ has made us victorious in him. Now, think. Right now. You think about games and football games and you think about tennis matches and wrestling matches, boxing. Who's going to be the victor? Who's going to be the loser? We're going to bet on who's going to win, who's going to lose. And we think about all these temporal, corruptible things in winning and losing. By the way, yesterday, now I know this is a recording so i got to be careful here. I played Sean Summers' team. He's the Golden Cheetahs. He has an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator. Just two coaches, but he says one of them's got one, one's got the other. He only had six kids yesterday. One of them was a scorekeeper. <laughs> About midway through the second half, he let me know. And I could tell he would recite the score frequently. I have no problem with that. You've got to keep score. How do you know who won or lost? Who's got the victory? I said, what's the score? Taller kid, six, six years old, taller kid, uh, dark hair. And he said, we are ahead 38 to 14. You are behind. <laughs> I already figured it out. By you being ahead, he said, you're behind. <laughs> of course, they went on to win. You see how much a six-year-old wants to win? Victorious. They want to be victorious. We want to be victorious in all these things. But spiritually speaking, we've forgotten that we're victorious in Jesus Christ over all the sufferings of this world, the sufferings and things that really hit you. When we focus on our suffering in this world, we lose out on the glory that awaits us. Remember, again, what that verse says up there. It says... But thanks be to God which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then when we look at, go to Romans chapter number 8, right? Are you there? Go to Romans 8. We're in 1 Corinthians 15. Go back a few pages. Go backwards a few pages to Romans chapter number 8. We're going to look at this suffering piece. And just very simply look and see, wow. I think Doc was just preaching. He's been doing Elijah, right? He's kind of gone through some <laughs> moments, hasn't he? I think he may have done that over the last couple of weeks. Last week, maybe. He's sitting there whining a little bit. Things don't go my way. A couple weeks ago. There you go. <laughs> Nobody understands. It's real suffering. He really did have a suffering moment. But God got him out of it because he focused on the suffering for a period of time. Okay? But then God said, why don't you put your focus on the one who provides? Why don't you put your focus upon the one who brought you the great victory at Mount Carmel? You see, when we focus on our suffering in this world, we lose out on the glory that awaits us. Ah, here's an old hymn. We did victory in Jesus. We've had a couple of them. Remember this one? Remember the backstory behind this. Because this man who wrote this, this song, we're reminded of the suffering he went through and losing his family. And he said, it is well with my soul. Remember that old hymn? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. So I put that up there because we, again, believers in Christ, when you look at Romans chapter number 8, verse number 18, and that's where we're headed today, you're going to go, wow, we do have something in Jesus Christ. We have so much. We're victorious in him. And we understand that. The gates of hell can't prevail against the church. We're more than conquerors. And now, defensively, building our defense in the Lord Jesus Christ, we realize the sufferings of this present time. They do not hold a comparison to the glory that we will see one day. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. Believers in Jesus Christ, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is well, it is well. When you grab a handle on a few Bible verses, as I've mentioned in preaching many a time, and you have some lockdown truth that you can put your life upon, 
When you think about a Bible verse or two or three or four, and they develop cornerstones for your life, with Jesus, of course, being the chief cornerstone of all that you believe, then you say, nothing's going to move me. I am going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because I know what it says in the Bible. You know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We are victorious. I remember when you, when you look up at that, that, that graphic, you look up at that, that, that artwork, and you see that V in victorious, and you think, okay, victorious. We looked last week, again, at the meaning of it. And I love the victory thinking. In your concordance, it says to utterly vanquish. It's a conquest, a triumph. And again, we look to, hey, did you win the ball game? Oh, we got a victory. Oh, did you win the football game? And that's fine, but this is victory over sufferings. This is being victorious over the things that somehow get us down. That being the title of our message today, Sufferings of This Present Time. I'm just going to look at a few of these here in a little bit, but I want to read the text in Romans chapter number 8 and tell you where God's taking us for the next few minutes. Verse number 18, chapter number 8, Romans. I know you're all sitting there. gave you a chance to get there. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. The creature is us. In Jesus Christ, we're waiting to be in glory with him. We groan because we want to be in the presence of the Lord. Real quick, and it's easy, anybody passed away, who you know is a believer in Christ, they're not groaning anymore. No more groans, no more travails, no more pains. But Paul is saying, in writing this to the church at Rome, the collection of believers in Rome, look, there is going to be this agony and groaning inside of us. Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. When you're born again, just what I said there, you will be oh, out of the corruption of this world and this sinful stuff in our flesh, and we'll be with him. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So the creature groans and the creation groans. We groan because even the creation wants to be redeemed, desires to be dreamed, redeemed because it's been messed with man's sin. And God is going to redeem it. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Anything that you can see is not hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The hope. The hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? If you see something, why would you hope for it? Verse 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. That's when you say, ah, oh, i got to have an eternal perspective. i got to think on things that are not of the sufferings of this world, but to the things that... Hey, are in glory because the things of this world, the sufferings of this present time, they're real. You have sufferings. Everybody has sufferings. We all have gone through sufferings. You're going to go through some more, but they're not worthy to be compared with the glory. You can compare suffering to suffering. You can compare, hey, you know, Steve Redding's been through some sufferings, and Bill, you've been through some sufferings. So we can compare and do all that in contrast or whatever, but you can't compare them. They're not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's a powerful statement. How is it that sufferings get us down so much? When verse 26, even just grabbing it real quick, tells us that the Holy Spirit groans for us and makes intercession for us. So the creation groans, we groan, the Holy Spirit groans. Why? Because we're stuck here. We're stuck in this mortal, corruptible body. But then in Jesus Christ, I'm reminded that I'm not trapped. I'm not pinned down. 
with faith and hope, I can continually reach out to the Father of glory through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the uttering and by the groaning and by the intercession of the Holy Spirit and know how to ask for things to get me through the sufferings. You see, sufferings very simply mean something that you're undergoing, a hardship or pain, affliction and affections, that which one suffers or has suffered. Externally, a suffering, a misfortune, a calamity, some evil that's come upon you, some affliction. Yes, what about the sufferings of Jesus Christ throughout the Bible? Paul says that he wants to know the sufferings of Jesus. And by the way, that's our last message next week, is the sufferings of Jesus Christ for you and for me. I think we need to be reminded of that. See, this message has special meaning today for me personally and for all of you personally that have gone through any kind of sufferings in this life because we have decided one way or the other because Jesus presented one way or the other. I can deny myself or I can live for myself. I can take up my cross or, excuse me, take up, take up the cross daily that I'm supposed to or ignore the cross. I can follow Christ or follow the world. I can lose my life for his sake or I can save my life for my sake. I can forsake the world or I can gain the world. Jesus Christ approached us. He's laid it down for us just because he did it exactly in the modeled perfect way when he did it for the disciples. And we're going to look at some of the disciples' interaction with Jesus Christ this morning to illustrate the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I remember so many times studying things like this and going, well, I guess we're all going to have to suffer, suffering for Jesus. We shouldn't say it so tritely. We shouldn't say it so as a matter of factly. We should actually look at the sufferings of this present time so that we will then point to the eternal, point to the incorruptible. That's this series of being victorious. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth. For the manifestation of the sons of God, that's what we wait for. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. We got trapped by this sinful state because of what happened in the garden. And now... As we see a passage of scripture like this, we realize that us as believers, yeah, we must suffer certain things that are afflictions in this life. Yes, we do. But we're taken up, sustained through them all. And he encourages us. He shows us that hope. This is how Jesus Christ showed us how to do it. I want to show you four simple things. We'll tie each one of them to a miracle that Jesus Christ did a few years ago. We did a little something on Jesus and, and uh, the Jesus in the church and looked at some of his miracles. We're just going to point out the interaction of Jesus Christ with his disciples and the disciples interacting with him just like you. Because the disciples thought, oh my gosh, following Jesus is really rough. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's suffering. It's so hard. It's so difficult. <laughs> Are we awake to the idea that Jesus Christ suffered far much more than we'll ever suffer? And his Bible says he did it willingly for you and for me. What do I do with all these sufferings? I need to do something with them. First of all, I believe we have to point them out. So here's the first one to point out. Suffering strikes us when we think Jesus will applaud failure. Now this world will applaud your failure. They'll kind of like call you out. Say, see, you messed that up. See, you messed up. Do you think Jesus? Well, sometimes we think that way. We Sometimes we think that way. It says there, there's a quote there from the Word of God in Luke 5. So why don't you go to Luke 5? We're going to use all four Gospels, an account for each one of them. It says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Do you recall who said that? Oh, Peter. Oh, Simon Peter. 
And the text that we're turning to is really, really an incredibly cool text. The first miraculous catch that these old fishermen had. You see, of the 12, it's said to be that probably seven of them, give or take, but it seems that seven of them were fishermen. They knew something about fishing. They are only walking with Jesus for a few months in the text that we are in in Luke chapter number 5. And we have this miraculous catch that occurs, and we see what Jesus Christ interacts with them about. Now just be aware of this phraseology, that Peter uses this term, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. Why? Because he's concerned about the way he appears to his other brothers, disciples, how he appears as a fisherman that lost his faith, how he appears to Jesus. There's so much here. We're just going to point out something about our first thought. Suffering strikes us when we think Jesus will applaud failure. Do you really think Jesus is looking to have you mess up and go, oh, I'm glad you messed up today? No. No. But the disciples thought they failed in their fish, their fishing expedition. Verse number 1, chapter number 5 in Luke and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and two ships, saw two ships standing by the lake. So the couple fishermen, they pushed these boats out, these, these uh, uh, ships out, these fishermen ships, and Jesus is standing on one of them to preach the word of God. But the fishermen were gone out of them and was washing their nets because, again, they had come in all night long from fishing. They had to wash their nets. They didn't want to tear them because if they had not washed them out, then the, the gunk of the water and everything, they had to wash off all the junk of the fish and all the stuff that was in there, or else their nets would not withstand. Verse number 3 says, And he entered into one of the ships, Jesus, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he left, had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. I want, for a drought, yeah, for a great reaping of your sowing and fishing. What did Peter say? Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. But it doesn't stop there. It says, nevertheless, at thy word, your word spoken, the word of God, your word, living word, Jesus, I will let down the net, master. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, fishes, and their net break, and they beckoned unto their partners, the other fishing peoples, while were, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came, and they filled both ships, so that they began to sink. They had so much fish, right? What happens with Peter? The little quote I put up there earlier. Simon Peter saw it. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the drought of the fishes which they had taken. Of course, James, John, sons of Ebony, these fishermen, they're amazed. What are we saying here? Think of these disciples looking at Jesus. He's teaching the word. He's speaking to the multitudes. He's in one of the fishing boats. He says, after I'm done speaking, push your boat out. Let's catch some more. What? You, you don't understand. We've toiled all night long. Do you want to applaud us for failing as fishermen? Do you want us to? See, here's at the moment where you go, you're suffering and going through something, and you have no idea why God's letting you go through it, and you're thinking, God just wants you to fail and fall on your face, and that's just the way it's going to be. And the Father in heaven... Through the Lord Jesus Christ, just like for the disciples in Jesus, he has something incredible for them. All they could think about is their failure. What is he trying to do? Is he trying to jump on our failure? Is he he's trying, to, trying to make us look bad? Jesus says, push the boat out. You're going to get more fish, and you have no idea what I'm going to do for you. You see, that's the way we are. And our sufferings in our life, a lot of times we have sufferings because we want God to tell us 
What are you going to do next, Lord? What do you want me to fail again, Jesus? I cannot believe that I've gone through so much for you, and now I'm at a place of failure, and you're going, <laughs> that's not what Jesus is ever doing. Sometimes we look and think, where is God? Why isn't he taking my side up? Does he want me to keep on failing? Absolutely not. He wants you and I to trust him. That's a piece of sufferings that I think we forget that the disciples are showing us. The second one I want you to see. <coughs> Suffering manifests itself when we think Jesus will abandon us. We think, huh, Jesus, why have you abandoned me? Where have you gone? You said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. Turn to Mark chapter number 4. This is a fun one. You know this one. The account of Jesus in the boat, taking a nap while the sea is out of control. I love Mark's account. You notice that both Luke and Mark, Mark using a quote, John Mark, Master, carest thou not that we perish? To me, the suffering manifests itself when we think Jesus, put it back one slide, Jesus will abandon us. Master, don't you care? Master, where did you go? Master, what's going on? Don't you care about me? Jesus, did you abandon me? Did you leave me all by myself? Are you leaving me out to hang? Master, 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 master and commander. It's an incredible title of honor. It's not a messianic honor. It's not a God honor. It's an address that you've given to the person that is the commander-in-chief. Jesus Christ, commander on this earth. Master, what have you done? Why don't you care? Don't you care that we perish? We're going to perish. Pick it up with me in Mark 4, 35. In the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, that, so that it was now full. And so, excuse me, we find out, and he, Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and he rebuked the wind. He said unto the, the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased, there was a great calm, and he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that the boat stopped when he spoke? And that's not what it says. That even the wind and the sea obey him. The disciples did nothing wrong when it comes to doing what he told them to do. Sometimes we say, ah, the reason we're suffering is because we've been disobedient. Oh, you people, you're facing the judgments of God. Well, that's fine. You've got old Jonah as a good example. Jonah faced the judgment of God because he, didn't know, he wasn't obedient to God. What did he do? He got whacked. God said, okay, you think you're, you think you're doing pretty good, buddy? You're disobedient to me? I'll put you in a situation that you wish you were never in disobedience what did the disciples do wrong they were in a place of obedience it says in verse number 35 when the evening was come he saith unto him let us pass over unto the other side and when they had sent away the multitude they took him even as he was in the ship they took him they obeyed and yet they're going through sufferings in obedience See, suffering manifests itself when we think Jesus will abandon us or put us in a place where we're all going to be all alone. Now you tell me in your life you haven't felt that way. There's been so many times where I thought, why have you done this to me? Why did you put me on a ship that is so filled with water that we're going to drown? Why have you done this to my family, to the ministry, to the people I know? Why have you abandoned me? 
You see, suffering does manifest itself when we think Jesus will abandon us. We're talking about not the actual suffering of looking like you're going to drown. It's the thought inside of your mind that messes with you. Danger can be awful, especially when you sense that Jesus has abandoned you in the most needful moment of your life. Jonah was like that. The disciples were like that for totally two different reasons. One for disobedience, one for obedience. And yet, in the midst of all that, the promise is there that Jesus Christ would not abandon them. And he won't abandon you. But yet suffering manifests itself when we think that way. We think this way. And the revelation of all his glory, all this incredible glory in Jesus that we have, to be in his presence, that's what we got to think about. That's in the calming of the storm. Because when it really comes down to it, suffering is real. And I think in this crowd of people that I know, every one of you could say amen. I know many of you. In your personal accounts, in confidence and privacy to me, sufferings. I think Jesus abandoned me. Well, I'll jump in the ship with your disciples. Whew. The third one. I believe suffering, identifying suffering, shows up when we think Jesus will not make provision for us. You ever get to the point where you think Jesus is supposed to provide a way, but he hasn't provided a way. Jesus is supposed to make provision for us, and I'm supposed to have the things that I need. Jesus is supposed to. Wait a minute. But what are they among so many? You know where we're headed. John chapter number 6. The only miracle that appears in all four Gospels. John's account's pretty fun. Because there's some solution finders there, and Jesus is testing them. You know us guys, we always like to find a solution for everything. Don't we, Tyler? We, we have an answer for everything. You tell me the problem, I'll tell you how to take care of it. You give me the situation, I'll give you the solution. So Jesus sets them up. You see, suffering shows up when you, we think Jesus will not make provision because we're going to lean on Jesus to make the provision, but yet he's given us a chance sometimes to go, okay, try to do that on your own, Mark. Go right ahead. You, you provide everything for yourself that you think you need. Okay, yeah, I know what to do. <laughs> let me go to you know, my notebooks and let me go to my Bible verses that I... <laughs> okay, solution, bam. But Jesus is the one that has to provide. The solution. And sometimes you're in a suffering thinking, where did Jesus go? Why hasn't he provided things? He's attempted to abandon me. I'm thinking that that's all Jesus is doing. Of course he's abandoned. No, he's not abandoning you. And what happened? He's in a place where he says he's going to provide. I'll, I'll never want for anything. But yet, I find myself in a situation where it's like, but what are they among so many? John chapter Number six, we see here, and Jesus is uh, accounting here, and the accounting in John, John's accounting of Jesus, and what he does to feed the 5,000. Pick it up in verse number one with me. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh, and when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him. He saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread? So Jesus sees them. The other accounts say something about how he has compassion. They're hungry. He needs to feed them. Jesus is showing his heart for the people. He's been healing them. They're following him. They want to be healed. And, of course, here's Philip's answer because Jesus, it says in verse number 6, this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. He says he knows, but yet we go through sufferings in our mind and our thought process because we think Jesus doesn't know or Jesus isn't going to provide because this is where a lot of the sufferings go on everybody right here right here because you're just like the disciples i'm just like the disciples so philip says okay 200 penny worth it was just like having 200 days of basically of of, of income and that's not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little one of his disciples verse number eight andrew simon peter's brother saith unto them there's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they? But what are they? But what are they among so many? 
And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, and you see what happens. The men numbered about 5,000, and we see this account in all four Gospels, and there's similarities in a few of the things that are said. Jesus says thanks to his Father in heaven, blesses, and then the food goes out. And of course, they find out how much food they had. Jesus provided I know that you know that I know that you know that you know that God will always provide. How is it, though, that we go through so many sufferings wondering if God's going to provide? Because it's true suffering. There's a couple that are expecting their second or third child. The husband loses the job. The wife loses their job. Things are tough, finances, the things that have been going on in our culture the last few years, not just the last year or two, for three, four, five, six, seven years. A lot, it's just things are eroding to a place where we look and go, who do I really look to to provide? Jesus, will you not make provision for me? Are you the one? Oh, my, my heavy heart that I worry over God's provision. Jesus, it makes me suffer in my mind. We forgot that the Holy Spirit of God maketh intercession for us, and he groans for you. In prayer for our life, we forget that God's Spirit groans for us on our behalf. We're saved through the hope and faith by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We live our life in a completed state in glory. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We need to give up our little like that little boy did, right? We know this story. We give up that little bit, and God turns it into unreal stuff. But if you want to really see if Jesus Christ is going to abandon you or not, or if he's not going to be there to provide for you, or you think that Jesus Christ is just messing with you, whoa, he is not doing any of that. In fact, I heard in the Bible that he sits at the right hand of the Father and makes intercession for us. Lastly, I see to identify suffering As you go to Matthew 14, suffering paralyzes us with fear when we think Jesus will bring harm to us. The disciples thought this. They did. They did. They thought, Jesus, why would you harm us? It is a spirit. And they cried out with fear. This is Matthew's account of Jesus Christ walking on the sea in Matthew chapter number 14. And when we see this, we realize in the text, oh my, oh my Lord, is it really to a point where these disciples would think you, Jesus, would allow or bring harm to us? Would you really do that? Would you really think that way? Look at verse number 23 in Matthew 14. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up in the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, though the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. When you open up the word of God and God shows you something in his perfect, beautiful word, Do you say, oh, this has to be another spirit? No, no, no. The Holy Spirit operates through this beautiful word. It's his word. We go and look at other words. We look to other references. We look up stuff. We get somebody else's opinion. We listen to a blog. We listen to this. And we don't go to the word of God, who is the living word of God, Jesus Christ. And the disciples are going in the fourth night, fourth watch of the night. Jesus is coming to them, walking on the sea, and they're thinking, it's got to be a spirit. They cried out for fear. Do we really realize that suffering paralyzes us with the fear when we think Jesus will bring harm to us? That's what we think of sometimes. We think that Jesus will bring harm. He's not bringing harm here. But straight away, Jesus spake unto them in verse number 27. He says, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, lo, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee in the water. And you see... Peter, he says, come, and when Peter was come down to the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And we know the the account and everything. Verse number 30, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. 
I know I, I've heard, I've taught on this passage more than once. I've, I've heard different breakdowns and all. I just, to me, just very simply, I wonder if this accounting here is very simply so we can see, we can hear those three words. Lord, save me. And all of that orchestration of everything that went on and all the intricacies of all the meaning of everything that's going on in that setting, the disciples were paralyzed. And they thought it was because it's Jesus was the reason. It was Jesus' fault for paralyzing them. It's Jesus' fault for not providing. It's Jesus' fault. No, it's not. It's not. It's because of Jesus that you and I are in the sufferings. And they're not to be compared to the glory. Some of you are just so tough and so strong and so resilient, and I thank God for you. But your sufferings can be compared to other people's sufferings. You've gone through some awful stuff. But just remember where the comparison breaks down. And that's when you and I take the sufferings of this present time and we think somehow, some way, they're worthy to compare. The verse says very simply up on the screen, for I reckon, for I reckon, there's Paul's little southern drawl, for I reckon, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. They can be compared to a lot of stuff. But don't compare them with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This creation groans to be redeemed. This new creature in Christ groans to be in his presence. The spirit groans to intercede on your behalf. And when I look up at that simple statement on the screen in reflection of our message today, I want you to just read it slowly. Right here, thinking. Victorious thinking locks up the sufferings of this present time and puts them away. Puts them away. It doesn't mean that they didn't happen to you. They happened. They are happening. They're going to happen some more. But like the disciples, what are you going to do? Think it's Jesus to blame in a bad way? No, it's Jesus in a glorious, credited way that we're going through sufferings in him because of his sufferings that redeemed us. The simple question up on the screen for our invitation, what are the sufferings you need to lock away what are the sufferings that you need to say, okay, God, I'm putting them all down. I'm putting this one down today, this one down today. I'm going to lock it away in the name of Jesus. I'll read this and be done. I read this on Friday. Excuse me, Thursday for Don's graveside. I read those few verses I read earlier, and then I said this. From 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished if we have no hope in Christ. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, right? But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man cometh death, but by man Jesus came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made. That's us. Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer? In our invitation time this morning, I just, as the music plays, I want you to consider that question. What are the sufferings that you need to lock away in the name of Jesus? Our Father in heaven, it's been a glorious day in the name of Jesus for what? we have experienced in you. Thank you for your word. It still remains our keystone, our cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. We lock into the truth of your word. 
and we're thankful for how the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared to the glory one day we'll have. I pray for my brothers and sisters in the Lord that this will be a time of prayer, of confrontation with truth, things that you've showed up in our lives as you revealed them in the Spirit. May we realize we're just like the disciples being confronted with truth in Jesus, and may we act upon them just as the disciples did in Jesus' name. Please stand. Please stand.